and is very interested in your historical weapon. Well, what this is, is a second model Brown Bess musket. Second model because the first model was about four inches longer and about two pounds heavier. Was that the one about as tall as me? This is, yeah, the first model, <laughs> yes, absolutely. So oh this, my is, goodness. this is second model Brown Bess. And you can see a small guy like me, it, it, it's <laughs> right up there. Um, but the first model Brown Bess would have been about that much higher. And as I say, a little heavier. They figured it out as things were, go as things were progressing during the French and Indian War that it was easier to cut the barrels down a little bit because of the wooded area and whatnot. But this was the assault weapon of its day. It is a 75 caliber musket. Now I'm gonna clean this. Well, this is again. very nice handwork in here. Well, if you notice, this was made in the Grice Armory pursuant to a pattern from 1762. Some of the muskets, if you look at them, some of the other men will have tower, which means the Tower of London, or some other uh, armory from the British. You notice it has the King Cipher on it. It does. George Rex. Look. Now, what's an American soldier doing with a British musket, you might ask? Well, armies are expensive. We know that. Modern armies are expensive. Ancient armies were expensive. So, once the French and Indian War, pretty much, or at least they called it the Seven Years' War in Europe, once that ended, um, the British did not want to keep a large standing army in the colonies, the North American colonies. Uh, because it was expensive. Very expensive. Um, you had to rely on the, each colony to provide uh, barracks, wood, food, uh, and it became, quite, it became quite expensive. So what they did was, uh, from the colonial foundings, every colony had militia laws. So from 16 to 60, you had to be in the militia. Um, if you had your own musket, fine and dandy. If you didn't, what the British did was they would take their surplus muskets and send them to the colonies. They would be in an armory. So when hostilities broke out in 1775, Americans had a, a, a ready stand of weapons. So essentially what you're doing was using British weapons against British soldiers. Um, so this thing, it weighs about 10 pounds. It fires, as I said, a three-quarter inch lead ball. It's a 75 caliber um, weapon. The weapon itself uh, is very unreliable. And, 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 and the most asked question I get is, why did everybody fire in line? Why were they standing so, shoulder to shoulder? It's the nature of the weapon. Unlike modern weapons that have a rifled barrel, these are, this is a smooth bore. So in effect, it is, if you can feel it, which you don't want to do right now after I fired it, um, it, it there, there's no rifling in this barrel. And the that best, makes it less accurate? It makes it far less accurate. The best example I can give you is a baseball. If you grab a baseball, you grab it by the seams, and when you throw it, you put a spin on the ball. That gives you accuracy, that gives you distance, all right? Take that same baseball and hold it in your hand like this and throw it. You're not gonna get the distance, you're not gonna get the accuracy. It may go that way, it may go that way, it may go that way, but it certainly won't go as far. Um, so that's the difference and one of the reasons they fired. The other reason they fired was the ignition system. Unlike Civil War, American Civil War uh, cap and ball muskets, this musket is flint and steel. Uh, and what it does is the flint strikes the steel. It actually shears a piece of the steel off. You can see the shear marks on there. And by doing that, it makes a spark. The spark goes into the pan. And if you can get close enough, you can see the touch hole. There's a hole in the bottom of the barrel. All right. And what it does is when you with the prime and loading sequence, I'll, I'll show you in a second. What it does is it burns through the powder in the pan, sets off the musket, and discharges it. The problem you have is that your flint. This flint has been very, very good to me. <laughs> All right. You can get five shots out of a flint, two shots out of a flint, 20 shots out of a flint. No rhyme or reason as to when this flint is going to fail. No rhyme or reason as to when this flint is not going to create a big enough spark to set the weapon off. So a soldier would have to carry in his bag the Extra powder, flint. the balls, the flints, everything. What they did is 
This is a British box, all right? Some of the boxes you see some of the other soldiers have militia boxes, they're called. They're much smaller. Uh, this I took from a British soldier who no longer had need for it. Um, so we ask why? Yeah, well, he, uh, he's no longer with us. Let's just say that. And he's not on his way back to England. Um, bottom line is... Now, you would put a cartridge in it. Uh, and you roll They would not issue the cartridges to soldiers. That's simple. Yeah. Uh, roll your own meant something a lot different back in the 18th century. <laughs> oh my. Yeah, well, let's not get into that. Anyway, what you would do is you, you had a, a piece of wood, a round piece of wood, a dowel, so to speak, which was the right size, and you would roll a piece of paper. When you roll the paper, you would put the ball in the bottom. Of, of that piece of paper, or that tube, as you would say. You can see, when I turn back this, you can see what originally it would have looked like. All right, so it's a tube, all right? The ball goes into the tube at the bottom. Now, they did it a number of different ways to secure it. Like this, not very good. Since there's no ball in this cartridge, it works fine, but with a ball, it makes it a little heavier and it would probably untwist. So what they would do is either tie a piece of string around the bottom, or more likely, melt the candle and dip this part in candle wax, and that would seal it. Then they would put a pre-measured amount of black powder in it. All right, and now this is the infantry, you have a few sets of opposing feet. So what you would do is, you would either do it by the numbers, as you saw us do earlier, level your muscle, prime, load, the whole nine yards, or you would just put the command to prime and load. If you're given the command to prime and load, you have to do it as fast as you can, and I will fire, and I will win. Notice this piece. So you put some gunpowder in there. Just enough to get you a discharge. Because you don't want to use it all. Okay? So you put some of the black powder in there. Now. Yes. You know what it means? No. That touch hole. This flashing. is now on half cock okay I could squeeze this till the end of the day nothing's gonna happen I'm squeezing the trigger I'm pulling it 
because I'm on half cock, it's a, it's a safety. The weapon will not discharge. So please don't go off. Okay? Another phrase we use now all the time. Now, the next thing would be make ready. The order is not take aim, the order is present. Because if you'll notice, because it's such an accurate weapon, what's missing from the back of this? There's no rear sight. There's no sight. Back in the front is the bayonet stud that holds the bayonet on. So the British soldiers in particular were told present, which was this. And once they saw the enemy, whoever happened to be at that particular war, all right, they were told to kind of push their head down so that they wouldn't get a spark in their face from the pan. Okay, that being said, now, everybody, That's how it goes. Now, if you notice, you see the smoke coming out of the touch hole? Oh, my goodness. All right. And that's how you know it went off, if you can see it. See the smoke coming out of there? All right. So it's, it, it peters out after a while, but there's smoke coming out. That's how you know it went off. If you were firing a, re a live round, you would know it went off because you'd feel that kick. It would, it's like firing a 10-gauge shotgun. It hits you right in the shoulder, um, and you'd feel it. All right. That's the nature of... The brown best musket. Um, ultimately, most of the battles were decided by the bayonet. Oh, how terrible. It is a terrible weapon. It is oh. an absolutely terrible weapon. This style of bayonet was outlawed in international combat. Um, and it does do a terrible wound. Also, the length. This thing will go right through you. British soldiers were trained to strike at a weak spot in the body. They don't want to hitch up in the chest because they're liable to get this caught in the rib cage. The whole idea was to strike you in a soft spot like your stomach. Uh, and it does a terrible wound. Miss, Mr. Q, wound. can you come up close and show the shape of that bayonet? Because it has a very interesting shape and that it is not flat like a, a, a regular knife. It's a triangular bayonet. And you can see the triangle side of it. Making it a very deadly wound. It's ex ex exceptionally deadly. It has to be sutured. You can't, you can't stop the bleeding oh. just by putting pressure on it. Um, that's item number one. Number two, the other thing you see in the movies all the time that's terribly inaccurate is these guys loading with their bayonets on. Um, notice A, you how can't difficult it is. Get, get right. All right. B, if it's sharp, you'll, you'll cut, cut yourself. And C, it takes much too much time. So the chances are what they would do is, particularly the British, when they got close enough and they were ready to do a bayonet charge, they would prime and load. They would fix bayonets. They would fire, give and you a then, volley, and then charge bayonets. And they would come at you screaming obscenities or whatever, God save the king, you name it. And they didn't do, again, Civil War charges, like you see in the Civil War, them running at you. They would literally march at you. Right, didn't they, in a line? And slowly. Yes. Um, they and, 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 my, and my friends, Look at how close this combat would be if you were in bayonet combat, how close to your opponent you would be. You would be looking into each other's eyes, obviously seeing that you are fighting another human being and how difficult it must have been for some of these men who had not seen war, who had only been farmers or sailors, to find themselves on the battlefield now confronted with killing someone else. And in the early years of the war, I believe that was quite difficult for them. It was very difficult. Um, they, were, they were up against a professional army. Uh, the average, there are statistics all over the place, but the most accurate one that I've seen is that the British, the average British private had about 10 years of service. Uh, so he was a, a the, the one that served in, a, in, the, in the American Revolution, had about 10 years of service in the British Army. 
which means he had probably fought perhaps in India, certainly fought on the continent in yes. the Seven Years' War, um, or the War of the Austrian Succession, or any number of European wars. So he was a trained combat veteran. This was nothing new to him. Um, they were trained to follow their officer's command. I think, was it Joseph Plum Martin who observed in one of the first battles he was in, I think he said that when they approached the battlefield, they were terrified that the boom of the artillery and they saw body parts, men laying in the grass, screaming in agony. And he says, and coming toward me, and I, I believe Mr. Martin was only 16 or 17 16 at, the time, at the time, he That's says, right. coming toward me were British soldiers no older than myself marching through the carnage as though it was nothing to them. So it gives us an idea of how hardened already to death and battle um, even a British regular was. Absolutely. These guys, these guys they were professional soldiers. Um, and, and you're right, Martin was a farmer. Um, there were blacksmiths, there were lawyers, there were all kinds Everything. of people. But these, most of these guys had not seen serious combat. Or if they had fired their musket, it was a, in defense of an animal. Or militia training, <laughs> right, which, right. which was kind of like what we just did here, gone out and fired, and then it's, let's go into a tavern and have a, and, and have a pint of And And I, I, I also believe the British were very well trained in intimidation tactics, were they not the way they dressed? the commands they used, the way they moved, they were very well trained in what we might call PSYOPs today. Well, for example, um, Americans didn't have any grenadier companies. Uh, all the European armies did. Now, to be a grenadier, you, I, could not, I could not be a grenadier. Not because I don't have the, me the metal to do it. I don't have the height. A I was going to ask. had to be six feet, was a going minimum to ask. of six feet. Then they put a bearskin cap on him with a polished front plate. Um, and that cap was generally anywhere from 15 to 18 inches high. So now you look like a giant is coming at you. And picture little me, okay? Short little me, <laughs> all right? Farmer, one each. And I'm sitting here saying, uh, he, 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 that, he's gonna hurt me. Uh, it's time to go. Um, the other thing with the bayonet that the Americans, uh, particularly the beginning of the war, they weren't used to it. Um, they didn't realize the, the power of a bayonet, uh, and it was heavy. So if they're on the march, they kind of like, I, I don't need this, and oh. they would throw it away. Um, or, worse still, they would use it to cook their meat, and of course that would bend it, and it was totally useless. Um, so now you've got British Army coming at you, and they're carrying this, and they mean business. Um, you're going to turn around and bolt, and they did, particularly right, they did. in the beginning of the war. They Very did. much so. Um, this regiment is formed in 1775, so that would have been the time of the war where um, there was a, you know, terrible, terrible lack of training. Um, yes. They didn't. They didn't realize there was a lack of discipline. That was one of the biggest problems Washington had throughout the war. Um, that's why he wanted Continentals. You were only in the army for one year. When your enlistment turned up, even if you were on the eve of battle, hey, uh, it's time to go. I'm going home. And you would leave. Uh, so he would be left with, you know, he wanted three-year enlistments at, at a minimum. Right. Um, so that's why you had Continentals. This is a Continental unit, uh, but we only served for one year. Mr. Q, perhaps you could tell us a bit about the buttons on your jacket. As you've been talking, I've been noticing your buttons. Okay. And um, it would be nice if you would explain to us the, well, it the your different buttons. Sure. It depends on the unit. Some units had buttons like this. A lot of them did not. They just had, and you'll notice, some of our guys here today just have what they call the flat buttons. Um, your unit would see it says New York 2nd Battalion. Now in 1775 the New York Provincial Congress uh, authorized four regiments. Uh, this is the 2nd uh, New York Regiment. Uh, and they would put on their buttons, you know, New York 2nd Battalion. And it meant 2nd New York Regiment. You'll also notice when they did the uniforms, as you're coming down the facings, you notice the buttons are in pairs. Because it was the second New York Regiment, so they would oh. put buttons in pair. All right. in interesting little thing. Not all of them did that, so they wouldn't have the third New York. Oh, I see. Yes, two in a space, two in a space. Stay away. See the way. See where they are. Um, that's what they did. The second New York did that. They would put them in pairs. Why? Because the British did that occasionally, depending on their regiment. Um, you could tell a British regiment. Everybody had red coats. Well, yeah, but you can tell a British regiment by the facings. Um, some of them are white, some of them right. are green, some right. of them are blue. Some of them had um, some kind of lace or decoration around the buttons. 
And that's how you could tell the different British regiments. And we had our share of all sorts of, of uniforms. I have a book at home, and if you flip through it and want to completely confuse yourself, you can look through one of these books and see all of the different ways that the Americans were dressed as well. And I find it impossible myself to tell who is who um, by the colors. Not everyone wore the same colors or even had the same style. Each, each uh, colony had its own colors, had its own uniforms. Um, if you look in our camp today, you're going to see some militia. I see. Uh, I'm going see to walk around and ask everyone. Different coats. Uh, if you'll notice, my uniform is not a military uniform. I'm wearing a civilian West. You are. I'm wearing a civilian tape. It's being taped, John. That's all right, because I'm going to ask him next to tell us who he is and what he's wearing today. You'll notice I have civilian socks you do and i have farmer's boots I mean, it one wore what they had the, you you came you were only issued you were only issued a regimental coat a musket a bayonet and a cartridge box if you showed up in camp with your own musket and your own cartridge box better still with your own bayonet what you got from wherever you got you got a ten dollar bounty you, you were a happy man um, you were issued one coat a year wow um, and, uh, you know, and you were issued your coat in May. It's wool, it's lined, it's heavy. Today it's very nice. But in July... July it's not nice. <laughs> very um, unpleasant. They would not wear them when they were on fatigue duty. So if they were cutting wood, they would not be wearing the regimental coats. So thank you very much very for welcome. spending this time with us today. I'm sure everyone is enjoying it. We're all very grateful to you. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. And we're going to see who else we can meet in the camp. By all means. Thank you. <laughs>